Well, it's 315. Uh, should we let in the people in the waiting room? Yes, I think we can now. So I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll add. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, everyone. And welcome, welcome to our session for today, our salon session for today. We have Miguel Gutierrez with Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed as a vehicle to promote critical media literacy. And I am your host, Amina Humphrey. I'm a part of the steering committee of the Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas. And I help to plan and organize the art, race, and social justice salon uh, sessions. So I'm so very glad for you to be here today uh, for our very first salon. Um, as you see here on the screen, there's some important documents uh, that you should be aware of. Uh, we have the summary of presenters, sessions, and Zoom links on the visual schedule. Uh, please register, share with your friends, uh, share on social media. We want many follows on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, and yes, please share with everyone so they'll have access to this information so they may register for this conference. There are a couple of uh, housekeeping um, items that I wanna review with you. I want to inform you that this session is being recorded. So if you are under 18 years of age or prefer to not be recorded, please uh, turn off your video and remove your name in order to be anonymous. Also, if a problem occurs and the Zoom closes, first try to re-enter uh, the same Zoom room. And if that doesn't work, go to the lobby on the visual schedule of the conference labeled help. I also want to give you some con more context about salons. Uh, this is a space for rich discussion and enjoyment to exchange ideas and to create new ones. And so all perspectives are welcome in this very safe space. And so you don't need to be an expert in the topic. I will be hosting this conversation to ensure that everyone who wants to speak will have the opportunity to do so and to share in this very supportive, meaningful, and collaborative space that encourages respectful participation. Uh, we have various salons planned for the three days. Each one will have a specific focus for the 60-minute uh, discussions. And also to give you some additional context, uh, this tradition comes from the Harlem Renaissance, uh, where people gathered in uh, salon-like parties in someone's home. Um, and they came together in a supportive, welcoming environment for artists to gather. And as we say down south, kick off your shoes, relax your feet, enjoy, relax, as we engage in some very important topics and discussions over the next three days. And so without further ado, let me please introduce Miguel Gutierrez. Augusto Boal's Theater of the Oppressed as a Vehicle to Promote Critical Media Literacy. Uh, according to uh, Miguel Gutierrez's bio, uh, he's taught at every grade level between seventh grade and doctoral students. In every educational setting, he says he uses Frarian principles to make students' experiences engaging, relevant, and transformative. He says that he's worked with Boal's for several years and used many techniques for over 25 years, including theater of the press. He's used these exercises in his classrooms for the last 15 years. He's found that theater of the press is a perfect tool to not only engage students, but also to provoke them to analyze images and relationships of power. And with that said, can we give a warm reaction to Miguel Gutierrez? Thank you, uh, Amina. Uh, this is, uh, I'm really excited to do the salon format. Uh, really, um, because this is what it sh should all be about. And I gotta say, it's a little awkward for me 
uh, talking about theater of the oppressed, but not doing theater of the oppressed. Uh, it's kind of antithetical to the whole principle, right? That you don't talk about it, you do it. But uh, be that as it may, in, in our current situation, we, we, you know, we make adjustments here. Uh, so as, as badly as I feel about talking about theater of the oppressed, I guess I'm going to talk about theater of the oppressed. <laughs> but uh, I have a lot of questions and I'm really, I really um, uh, again, I'm excited to just hear a conversation about how we do critical media literacy. Uh, and I guess I, I can start off by just telling you how um, what part of my approach is with using Frarian principles and uh, Augusta Ball's Theater of the Oppressed. So uh, those of you, I, I don't know to what extent y'all are, are aware of, have done, or are experts on the Theater of the Oppressed, but just broadly speaking, uh, the Theater of the Oppressed uh, created by Augusta Ball uh, in the 1960s, 70s, and onwards in Brazil um, is, is a broad set of highly interactive exercises and games. And so uh, when some people think theater of the oppressed, it's acting and well, it's, there's acting involved, but it's, it's just think about it as interactive techniques and skill sets. Um, a lot of people have seen theater of the oppressed techniques without even knowing about it, because a lot of uh, even uh, companies, even corporations have used these things for uh, um, icebreakers, right? To get to know each other and, and break the, right? That kind of stuff, uh, it, Theater of the Oppressed is an excellent uh, form to look into to use icebreakers. So it's not just a monolith of one type of Theater of the Oppressed exercise, there's different branches within the Theater of the Oppressed. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine last night. Uh, that's why to me, it's so flexible because Boal talked about the arsenal of the Theater of the Oppressed. It's whatever's right for you in your own context you understand that context more than Boal does. And so he always said, make it yours, do your own thing, make it do whatever you want it to do or, or whatever you need it to do at the moment. And if it doesn't do that, feel free to modify it, which I always really appreciated about Boal. Like this is yours, make it, uh, modify it, do whatever you need it to do. So um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the, um, I guess, general ways that I use it, but um, I gotta say that especially uh, when I taught a couple of courses at UCLA on critical pedagogy. And those of you that are especially classroom educators, there's a, there's a, a frequent frustration when we read either pedagogy of the oppressed or we hear about critical pedagogy or some of these awesome ideas. And the educators that were in, the, in my classroom, there was always the same question like, okay, that sounded great. How do I do this Monday morning? I got a class Monday morning. How do I do that tomorrow morning, right? And that's like, uh, it's almost like the final frontier, right? That academics want to think about this stuff, but don't necessarily tell you how to do it. And there's also a reluctance that I think is well-founded to say, um, Frarian pedagogy is not a how-to. It's not a formula on how to do it. It's a sensibility. It's a philosophy. It's an attitude. It's a worldview. It's a way of life, which is also true. But that doesn't help me Monday morning. I need a lesson plan. I need to be Frarian. I need to do critical media literacy with them. How do I do it? And so one of the, one of the, the ways that I think about it, like something that's really practical, um, and I mean education, not just in formal classrooms, but all settings where there's education and liberation going on, whatever that space is, right? Wherever it is, whoever it is, anybody that's concerned with emancipatory education um, can put some of these principles to use. So let me say something else about um, in my understanding about pedagogy, right? Um, I've had a semi frustration with my children the last couple of years when I pick them up from school and it happened this morning again. And I realized they're telling me something really important but I haven't been receptive enough to listen. When I ask them, what did you learn today? And of course my older uh, daughter, she's like, yeah, I don't know. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, you've been in school for 11 years, girl, you don't know, you haven't learned anything. And the little one, he's in preschool, and I picked him up from school today. And after I give him a hug, I ask him, ¿Qué hiciste? What did you do? Or I'm sorry, ¿Qué aprendiste? What did you learn today? And his answer is really um, consistent. And his answer is always, today I drew, I made a drawing. Yep. So I'll ask him, but what did you learn? And they'll say, well, we did an activity. We drew. We and today when I asked him, I said, uh, what did you learn today? And he said, I, I drew something. And I said, but what did you learn? He said, I have it in my backpack, right? Like he has the learning in his backpack, right? And so I think um, 
if, if I really think about what I've been proposing for a lot of years, and I'm not listening to my son, what he's telling me is that to learn is to do, to do is to learn, right? Experiential learning. So when I, what did you learn? I learned through this process that I'm doing here. And I thought one of us has a clearly more um, sophisticated understanding of learning. And I think it might be my preschooler, not me. Right. And I also wanted to point that out that in, in his conceptualization of learning, doing uh, in Spanish, the verb uh, to experience is experimentar. Uh, not an experience, but the verb to experience, which is also the same verb as to experiment. So to experiment and to experience is the same word in Spanish. And you think to experience, experiment, to do, to learn by doing, it's all the same thing, right? And so I think that's what my child or my children have been pointing out all this time to my ears that haven't been listening, like, hey, I'm learning by doing. I'm doing by learning. There's a book by Paulo Freire and Miles Horton called, um, it's based on, they based the title of a poem, We Make the Road by Walking. We do this thing by doing the thing, right? And so I guess that's like what, I, what I'm concerned about. How do we do this thing? Um, really quickly, and, and that, again, just uh, in terms of basic Freudian principles, that pedagogy of the oppressed is called pedagogy of the oppressed. Why do the oppressed need their own pedagogy? Why do they need their own uh, style of learning and teaching? Because conventional teaching upholds the status quo. Conventional teaching upholds the way things are. And if that doesn't benefit you, then why uphold that? Why do the same thing? So in order to change society, you have to change schooling and you have to change pedagogy. You have to change the approach and how people learn. Um, the other thing that I want to just really quickly throw out about pedagogy of the press is uh, this concept of monologue versus dialogue, that these are not just ways of talking with each other, but these are forms of relationships. This is a way of relating to each other in a monological relationship or a dialogical relationship. And so in the traditional way of teaching is a classic monologue. It's a power dynamic where the teacher is the active subject. The teacher talks, the teacher moves, the teacher evaluates, assigns grades, and the student is in no position to do any of those. You can only passively listen. You can't move. You can't go to the bathroom unless the teacher tells you, right? Uh, you don't know nothing of value because the teacher is the one that knows stuff of value. Therefore, the teacher evaluates you and you can only be evaluated. You can only be graded. And that dynamic that we have in the great majority of our classrooms is a power dynamic, right? Of, a, of an oppressive monological relationship. Finally, the other uh, Frarian concept that I want to just throw out, just make sure that we are all you know, generally aware of these is uh, what he calls conscientização in Portuguese. And Freire also had a, a resistance, a reluctance to even translate that word. In English, people have translated to conscientization, but he said, you know, in, in Portuguese, it has a sense that it doesn't translate over to English. And any of you that are bilingual, those of us that are bilingual, trilingual or more, you know that there's words that don't neatly carry over, right? So conscientização is this critical consciousness raising. This, he keeps calling it as an unveiling, as an emerging, unmasking of reality as it is, uh, of, of an insight. And all of us can think of our own conscientização or elements of conscientização throughout our lives. And that's very important to me to um, encourage students in their own conscientização. So the way that I see critical media literacy is uh, whether it's implicit or explicit, and I'm sorry, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just going out on a limb here, but I see it as deeply Freirean anyway, right? Because in the sense that Paulo Freire emphasizes, emphasizes literacy in reading the word, but also reading the world, understanding what this world is composed of and where we stand in it and how we can change the world that doesn't benefit us. So critical media literacy for me is just a natural fit that shows us, teaches us how to read the world, not just technically words, right? So I guess moving on to the theater of the oppressed, what can the um, theater of the oppressed do for Frarian educators or critical me media literacy? Uh, for one, it's, uh, it's in essence highly interactive. It's participatory at its core, except for what I'm doing right now, right? Which is a monologue, which is like, I get, I'm sorry, Augusto. Like, I worked with Augusto Ball so many years and I, I think he's okay with it, but 
Anyway, just participatory, right? It's a democratic form of education. It breaks the molds of education as domestication and opens up the venues for domestication as liberation. One of the ways that uh, Bual does that is um, a couple of concepts that he introduces. One of them is demechanizing the body and the mind. Uh, that if you want to liberate, you want to do something that's different, some kind of change, you want to be a change agent in society, then you can't have the same forms of thinking. You can't have the same forms of talking. You can't have the same forms of teaching, right? Because those are all recreating that oppressive, domesticating world. So where do you start? How do you do it? And for Boal's theater of the oppressed, uh, a key way to start is just like, let's do some games. Let's play. The human need to just play with each other. We are constantly reminded that we should not interact and play. And I know that a lot of my noble colleagues in academia would say, oh, you're having fun in the classroom? That's ridiculous. I know, I just, this is 2021. There's people that talk like that, that you should not have fun when you're learning. That's idiotic, I think, right? There's got to be some kind of sense of appreciation and uh, engagement in your learning. And so Boal's games are highly interactive. They're, they're, they're fun. People are laughing. People are screaming. People are doing their thing. Right, because we have that human need to play. So, as participatory playing, it also demechanizes your body because you're moving in different ways that you don't normally move. In fact, a lot of my students, a lot of participants, the day after, if I talk to them the day after, they're sore. They weren't working out, but there's like, you know, I don't normally walk around like that. That's weird, and my muscles that I wasn't using. But you're also demechanizing your mind, and, and you're doing exercises in ways that you don't normally push your mind. So that's part of the demechanization and breaking the existing molds of domestication. Um, I guess finally, the, the last uh, concept here that I wanna throw out is for educators, uh, scaffolding. That in order to have this new lesson, we gotta activate the prior knowledge. Where do you start? Well, you gotta find out what it is that your students know already. Where are they at now? What are they thinking about now? And you build on that. You don't treat them as empty slates, uh, that have nothing of value. Of course, they, that's not true. So we scaffold on what already exists, but the scaffold is not the final structure that we want to create. It's something else. The scaffold is just a way to get us there, right? So um, I think in my experience that Boal couched within a Frarian approach to education is a perfect scaffold for critical media literacy because specifically what Boalian exercises are asking us to do. And he has a lot of games. By the way, um, so, uh, I think some of his folks in Rio, they, they set out to do all of the exercises that uh, in the arsenal theater of the oppressed. And it took him like two years to get through all of them. It's massive, it's massive. So within the games, um, it, I think you'd be interested to know here that within the games, and I'll put a, a link here for the um, a, a very important book that he has called Games for Actors and Non-Actors. But um, the family of games that he has, one of them is called uh, feeling what we touch. So there's all the feeling exercises where you actually have your body touching something else or somebody else, right? Uh, they're usually blinded. So you can just kind of hone or in his words, dynamize your sense of feeling what you're touching. The other ones, the other group is listening to what we hear and just thinking about at this very moment, all of these ambient sounds, right? I'm a musician also. And I see Matt is, is here with us, uh, my friend Matt, also a musician. We hear things all the time, but are you really listening to all that stuff that's going on, right? We just tune it out. So this is like sharpening your senses to be more observant, listening to what we hear, seeing what we look at, and being conscious of space as we move around the space. For example, here's, here's one of the examples uh, that is a really common one to just make it a little bit more uh, specific here. Uh, common theater of the oppressed game is, um, anybody could do this just about anywhere here. If you get about five or six chairs and you put all the chairs in front of the room and you clear a big space, whatever, and you just have five, six chairs. And then everybody in the room makes a circle around the chairs. And you ask people to come and sculpt an image of power using the chairs as your clay, as your sculpture. You don't have to use chairs. Uh, I've used uh, uh, water bottles. You can use lunch boxes, you can, whatever, whatever you got at your disposal. So you say, here's these five chairs. Uh, 
show me power. What does power look like? So inevitably one person will go out and they're supposed to do it without talking, without explaining. So I'm just supposed to see your conceptualization of power. They'll come up, somebody will put the four chairs on the bottom, one chair on top, there's power. Somebody will put one chair facing the other four chairs, there's power, right? Whatever their conceptualization is. But what you're doing, again, you're participating, you're seeing what you're looking at, and all of these concepts of what I think are scaffolding towards critical media literacy. If I had to start this week and say, I'm going to do a whole week of critical media literacy, I would start with a whole day of just Boal's exercises, because it warms us up, right, to being observant, to actually see what we're looking at. And then once you do, I can see these five chairs in the power dynamics, extend it. How do you see power dynamics set up in this room before we ever showed up? Well, all the chairs are facing the right, the one way. That's the front of the room because that's the teacher's desk, right? And then now with the, we examine the room space. Look at that billboard that you saw on your way here. How do we examine what's going on in that? So I think this is like a really natural progression and it's not uh, an accident because of the Frarian principles that Boal in his theater of the oppressed as a theatrical version of the pedagogy of the oppressed is, uh, is showing us. Last thing. I'll say about this is when I was doing my dissertation and I was using theater of the press as part of my research, one of the things that came out is that um, many students, when they were asked about the value of the theater of the oppressed was, and this kept coming up organically, uh, they would use analogies of seeing, right? I see the professor, he was talking about some idea, some concept, but then he showed us the theater of the press. Now I see the concept. Um, my classmates were talking about a proposal and how to deal with this dean that don't listen to us. But then we did forum theater and I was able to see the response. I was able to see the possibilities, right? And then finally, perhaps most important, in most of our classes, most of the time, if we have this basic monological setup in there. Students don't even look at each other. They don't even see each other. So in this case, students were actually encouraged to see each other. And I, I like I like this. Um, uh, it's not just a play on words. It's about the origins of the word respect, right? And I got that from uh, Dr. Joy Degree Leary. Joy, Joy Degree talks about what it is to respect somebody. It means to see somebody, to not to treat them as invisible people that don't matter. I see you. I respect. Spect. I see you, right? And I think that's what happened with the theater of the press that we all spect. We all see each other again, and we can interact in these ways that are breaking all kinds of boundaries and so i guess more, that's that's all i got to say basically on this but i'm um i'm really interested in um how do we do the thing how do we do critical media literacy because there, there's obviously not one way forward there's an infinite amount of paths on doing critical media literacy but uh, those of you that are interested i'll put the um uh, a link for just the what i consider a very important book actually if you, i'm looking for the there's a chat oops called games for actors and non-actors by augusta boal if you're interested in knowing more you could try to read uh theater of the oppressed by augusta boal uh it's pretty abstract it won't necessarily show you the cookbook version of how to do the thing right but games for actors and non-actors, just as it states. Oh, there it is. Hey, hey. All right. We got like multiple people there with the copy in front of them. Um, great book. And it is like a cookbook version, right? They say, let me, let me browse through this. What can I do in my classroom? What you're going to see is a whole bunch of them. You say, I can't do that. Or we're not ready to do that. Um, but you'll find a whole bunch of them and say, that's very doable. Some of them take five minutes. Some of them take longer. But they can all be scaffolded onto each other, loaded up onto each other. When I work with Boal, um, and one time uh, I, I was fortunate enough when I was growing up in Omaha that uh, after about a year that I had been working for him, he, he stopped by at a time that was really important because there was so much police violence in, in my community. And friends of mine, a friend of mine got killed. Another friend of mine got severely beaten up because of the, um, uh, he ran a red light. That's, that was his crime. So uh, Boal came to my church which I thought was kind of surreal. Augusta Ball is in my church and the priest is going to let him in. Like, I don't know, you know, but, and so on the way there, I asked Ball, I said, what are you going to do with the church? And he said, I don't know. 
I thought, oh, come on. What are you going to do? What, what are you going to, what exercise are you going to do with the parishioners there? And he said, uh, I'm not sure. And I thought, this guy's BSing me. But I think what he was, was, what he was trying to tell me there, again, as you can tell, I don't listen very well, right? When people are telling me good things. Uh, he is not, he doesn't have a predetermined understanding of what's going to go on because he needs to see the space. He needs to talk to the people. He needs to feel the ambience. And then let's see where it goes. Right? So that's what the theater of the oppressed is. Flexible, your thing. And again, these are Bawal's words. Take it, do your own thing. That's all on my part. So now, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing the rich context. And I would like to open it up for our audience here. Please, what are your questions? What are your questions? Let's, or should I say, what are the discussion points? What would you like to talk about at this point? Um, if I can just jump in, I guess. Um, well, I'm. Th thank you for introducing me to this topic. I've heard of theater of oppressed, but I I didn't know what it was. And you talk about these activities being like a scaffold for students, but I'm struck by it's also a scaffold for the educators as well. Like sharing power in the classroom is not easy for a lot of educators, and it doesn't come naturally. And so. I'm just I'm thinking about this as like also a way to 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 like it's pedagogy for the instructor as well. Like these are things you can do, and perhaps it it's also like sparking creativity and what where you can go from from here. So I'm I'm excited to check out these resources for sure. I, I got to throw in there that uh, to Michelle's comment. Um, some of you know. Uh, my wife, I, in fact, I know Amina because uh, my wife introduced us, uh, Alexia McGovern. And I am very proud that I've taught at every grade level between seventh grade and PhD, by the way. I, <laughs> I consider that like an awesome aspect of myself. But uh, I've always told her that I was never trained as a teacher. I never went through a credentialing program. And so I keep saying, I'm not trained as a teacher. I don't have any teacher training. And she keeps saying, yes, you are trained as a teacher. I'm thinking, no, I'm not. So we have this argument going back for a <laughs> decade now. But she keeps saying you have been trained as a teacher because of the theater of the oppressed training that you got from Bowal. And I thought that's not teacher training. And she's right. Right. Because it it, uh, it diffuses that power dynamic. And so how do you do that in the classroom? You already have done it. So I think to Michelle's point, absolutely. It, it's a good practice. It's a good way to let you ease you into that conversation, into the interaction with students in a very different way. Mikhail, I'm just thinking about what you just said, you know, um, I see some of my students here. I see former students and friend Victoria um, and the, and they will be or they have and some will be going through the traditional teacher prep programs and um, spending a lot of time in schools in South Central Los Angeles, East L.A. and beyond. Um, there are many restrictions in schools as this power structure. What advice do you think you could give to beginning teachers about how they can employ strategies and techniques in the classroom, given all of the constraints? Uh, basically, how to be how to be courageous. Well, I think that's to Michelle's point, right? Like we got to have it's it's the same thing whether you're going in a Frarian education or whether you're gonna do in the uh, critical media literacy, or you wanna just not be such a top-down teacher, right? We gotta scaffold ourselves. We gotta give ourselves a little baby steps going in there. And, and I think, I've never thought about the theater of the press in that way for, for the professors, right? For the teachers, but absolutely. I think that's a, that's a way to practicing that courage of saying, you know, I'm not willing to give up my grade book. I'm not willing to give up my syllabus. I'm not willing to give up my lesson plans that I worked all night for. Uh, but maybe we can do this little exercise where we interact as human beings versus me being their boss. So I think that's a that's a really powerful introduction for ourselves in practicing that kind of, you know, see how it goes. Because again, Boal is telling me the same thing. Like, try it out. Try the easy exercise first. See how that goes. Oh, it didn't go very well. Try a different, go uh, recalibrate. And again, back to the theater of the oppressed arsenal. Uh, you start with really 
easy ones that are very low um, low risk for myself as a teacher and for the students. And then you take it from there. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I almost always, almost always start with the same exercise. Um, you know, I wonder if we could actually do it right now. Even, even those of you that don't have your cameras on, you can just do it in front of you and you know, just by yourself there. Uh, if you take your right hand and make a circle, just make a circle in the air, all right? Just, those are pretty good circles. Really focus on that perfect circle, right? And of course, the bigger, the better. If you can use your whole arm in it, get your all art, great. You can stop that. And then with your left hand, make a square. A perfect, and think about geometry class now. Those of you that are mathematicians, perfect square. 90 degree corners. Keep that square going. Okay, you can stop. Now go back to your right hand and make the square, make the circle again, I'm sorry. And keep the circle, focus on it. Don't let it go and add the square at the same time with your left hand. <laughs> Add the square. <laughs> Vivian, I see two circles. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I don't, did anybody get it, by the way? Did anybody, anybody feel that you can share with us and show us an exemplary, uh, mo more or less? All right, all right. You want to show us? No takers? Yeah, that, okay, that okay. Wasn't that wasn't necessarily meant for you to say yes. And oh, okay, okay. Pop, but wait a minute, since you have, since you have, okay. I gotta start one first. I don't know, but you see how much slower I had to do it. Well, that was off camera. I don't know, I don't know, yeah, but okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have to take your word for it. Yeah, so so that, see like something, that, an exercise like that, there's, there's a lot of exercises that require it. And I remember when I was doing this uh, early on, uh, they require like touching other people and I wasn't ready to touch nobody, you know what I mean? Uh, and nor somebody else, or there's the whole blind series, blind series games that you close your eyes and you're moving around in the room. And again, a lot of us for sometimes very good reasons, we don't want to close our eyes and move around and let people touch us, right? So uh, can you get to that point and you say, all right, everybody, we're going to close our eyes and you're going to move around the room? No. Right. So the easing into it is like, all you got to do is make a circle, make a square. Can we do that? And what usually happens is nobody can do it. And so we all kind of share that, you know, none of us are experts, even the guy that's been doing this for years, he doesn't know how to do it either. Uh, yeah. And Michelle make that comment in the chat. I'm going to turn to the chat. I want to make sure I acknowledge everyone here. It also shows the teacher as not being the expert, which is good. That was Michelle's comment. Michelle, let's see who else we, MG, same here, not trained as a teacher. You've made me feel better. Vivian, how have you been applying the theater of the oppressed online? So that question is for you, Miguel. How have you been applying the theater of the oppressed online? Uh, I think I've tried and failed. I, I don't know how to do it. I don't have the chops to um, try the stuff like that. And besides with my students uh, at the beginning of the year, doing like a quick, um, what do you call it? Uh, exercise like this, beyond that, a lot of them just, just require the physicality, the physical space. And that's like one of the, the uh, what I've seen as the huge limitation in as far as I can see. I wanna talk to more uh, theater of the oppressed practitioners and seeing what have you been doing in this last year, right? But one of them is breaking down, literally, breaking down the physical spaces, moving the desks, moving the, the, uh, the chairs to create our own space and doing this thing. And online, how do we do that? Um, we, we tried, again, it was a try and a fail, but it was fun. Uh, just like we have these, we've been talking to squares for the last <laughs> 18 months, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the things that we tried was just having a ball and passing the ball to a person off screen and the other person receives the ball, but they have their own ball that is different. So somebody starts with a beach ball and the other one ends up with a golf ball going through, right? And then you keep keep it moving a gum ball at the end. And it was like disastrous. Like I gotta admit, it was disastrous. It was like, we couldn't coordinate this thing. And then some people just couldn't move the squares around. And it was like, it was hilarious. It was fun. Did it break anything down? It did break, it broke the the, the monotony of the moment, monotony of the Zoom and 
the teacher is not so square after all. He's not such a bad guy, maybe, right? Maybe he can actually smile and laugh. But did it work in terms of how we envisioned it? No. So that's about as far as I've gotten, Vivian. Again, not, not very successful. I don't have a lot of success stories there. Um, and in that way, I'm looking forward to, um, to doing this again. And of course, during the pandemic, not the best time to be interacting closely with each other and all that stuff, right? So limitations of theater of the oppressed. I want to, one other point in the chat, and then we'll go to analysis. Analysis has its hand raised. Uh, from MG, thank you. Gracias. Do you recommend Boal for student, for, no, no. Do you recommend Boal for adult students, for adult students, adult learners? Absolutely. Uh, the, those, I guess the youngest groups that I've done this with are kindergartners, first graders, and again, choosing wisely, right, the, the exercises. And I've done this, um, I used to volunteer and work, um, I used to work at a juvenile detention center and mm -hmm. volunteered at the, um, at the state pen for a while. Right. And we did these exercises. And I know some of you thinking like, wait a minute, you do this stuff in the state pen? It was awesome. It was, I think it was, um, I don't know who enjoyed themselves more there. Like if, if we as a, people that brought theater of the oppressed or the inmates, but it was, um, it, it was pretty powerful. And um, so I have no reservations about doing this with adults or with children. Analysis. Thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, first of all, before my question, I just need to tell you how elucidating I find your example with your son and how he insisted on what he had done and the thing that he did and i just that that spoke right to me in terms of reminding myself how in my own actions and whatever and organizing or whatever the case may be to emphasize the the point of of, of active learning um we've spoken a lot in terms of classroom setting but i'm wondering if you had the opportunity you just talked about uh in in prison situation i'm wondering if you had the opportunity also uh, in faith settings to do this ministries, justice ministries are part of my background. So I'm thinking about this in terms of certainly faith settings, in terms of organizing groups uh, uh, and action groups and nonprofits and, and bringing those settings to, to uh, that type of uh, active uh, theatrical learning. And I'm wondering if you had an opportunity in, in those settings. Yeah, um, I appreciate the comment about uh, my son teaching me that. I, I'm still trying to get over it too. I think it's a powerful uh, lesson that um, I, I think I finally caught on to this morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, uh, slow learner on my part. But in terms of the, uh, the ministries, uh, I personally have not taken it in those specific spaces. And, I, and I'll use the example again of Boal coming into uh, they, it was like a pray, like a Thursday night prayer service they had at uh, my church when he came in, and um, I I mean I just thought there was like so many inconsistencies here about politics and you know it's church at least the Catholic church is like you can't go into the altar you got to sit down in the pew boy right and don't be talking and this thing starts at eleven o'clock not eleven o five you can't yeah I mean it's rigid right and so I thought how this is like the antithesis this is the of rigidity how is that gonna and when when the priest said uh, yeah this is cool like and the priest in that particular instance made the uh the connection of social justice is a christian thing to do right and that particular priest had that attitude of course not universally right but uh um and and i thought but these are old stuffy people and they're not gonna do these games and i was so wrong because yeah. Ball got in there and he got them all to get up. He, he got them all laughing. He got them all interacting. So that, that goes to not just the theater of the oppressed, but Ball as a master. Uh, he didn't call himself ever a, um, uh, a uh, facilitator. He said, if anything, he was a difficultator. He's not here to make it easy for you. He's here to make it more difficult. But the word that he used most often, and those of you that know the theater of the oppressed, uh, he, called, um, he calls us or he calls the practitioners jokers the joker as the one that is entertaining, but also like in a deck of cards, the joker that can do whatever you need me to do at the moment to get this thing done, I'm the joker, right? You need me to play that part, I'll play that part. 
And so, so Boal being the joker and saying, I'm flexible, tell me what you need from me and let's make this thing happen. So he made it happen in a place that I thought was almost impossible because of its rigidity. Um, and in terms of uh, using it in, in um, broadly in, in most spaces, let me give you another example of another branch of the theater of the press, which is called forum theater. Um, I haven't talked about it at all. And again, I feel, sorry, I type with two fingers, but I still did my dissertation, all right. So in forum theater, uh, what you have is the, the participants, if, if you have time enough, uh, create a very short scenario, like a two minute, one to two minute short scenario that is emblematic, that symbolizes some other issue that is important to us all. So if we were to go through this, if we were in person and we were to do a forum theater session, we have uh, how many people here? We got 16 people. The 16 of us would probably break up into four groups, four groups of four. And the first part is just talk. Just talk, what's going on with y'all? What's going on today? What are the things, and this word frequently gets used by Boal, what things resonate with you today? Doesn't mean that it's the most important thing in the world, but today I'm thinking about, so for me, if somebody asked me today, uh, we just had a, a meeting with the Dean uh, an hour ago, right? Where students were voicing concerns, where they, you're out, you're, you guys aren't listening to us. We've been asking you for months, this is what we need. This is what we want for, for us to be uh, whole and well in this university. So that's what's been buzzing with my head all day. I wanna talk about student participation on campus, right? And let's see what the other, my other classmates, my other partners say. And so when we talk about things, eventually you're gonna come down to a thing that resonates with all of you, right? Eventually we're gonna find that there is a common ground. Oh, I, I dig that idea. We're gonna talk about such and such. For example, within the ministries, if there is a um, concept that you wanna explore specifically, what does justice look like? What does power look like? What does participation look like? You can introduce the, the, the concept if you want, or you can have the, the, the participants introduce their own concept. What they do after they talk about what resonates with them is they create a scene, very short scene, that shows us that issue. But it's gotta have a protagonist and an antagonist, the good person and the bad person. We are the protagonist trying to get something from this person that doesn't wanna give, that keeps saying no, right? Keeps denying us our humanity in some way. And then again, I'm, I'm making this a, a simple version of this, even though it's a little bit more, a lot more robust. Uh, you show the, the, the protagonist trying to get something from the antagonist. And then you show the audience. Here's this scenario of a student talking to the dean and the dean keeps shutting them down. And the student says this argument, but the dean shuts them down again, right? And then you show it to the audience say, what can the protagonist do? How should we, how can we interact with the Dean in a way that we get what we want? And then you bring up people to replace the protagonist and try something new, a new scenario. Uh, that's what Boal did because the issue was about police brutality, right? And so, well, wow, man, what do you do with a cop? The cop's about to hit you with the baton. What do you do? I don't know, get hit by, by the baton. I don't have a lot of choices at that moment. But we did talk about when you do when you go to city council meetings and you confront city council about them not doing enough, how do you interact with these people, right? So that scenario, or I'm sorry, that thing that I just described to you about forum theater, I haven't seen a place where that doesn't work. And the, and the, secret, and the, the secret sauce here is that it always works because you are asking the audience to talk about what they want and what they resonate with so it's always gonna be engaging because I didn't tell you what, what you have to talk about, you decide that. And so in, in the, uh, back to Michelle's point and other people's points, how does this you know, translate over to the classroom? Uh, that's student-centered pedagogy, for real, not some distorted version of it. Because I did say, you talk about whatever you want, you create your own scene about whatever resonates with you and show the rest of your classmates. At the end of our session, we'll have four, forum theater pieces, everybody sees it, and everybody selects, which one do you want to do today? Which one resonates with you in this? We want to do the one about the student dealing with the dean. Okay, so it's always 
I, I haven't run into an example when that doesn't work. So I think that within your ministry's um, analysis, like if you find some of those forms that are flexible enough and you find a topics or the people tell you what the topics that resonate, I think you can find all kinds of um, juicy uh, opportunities there. No doubt. Thank you. I, I'm thinking about the conversation and I'm also thinking about uh, those of you out there who've had the opportunity to employ some of these techniques and would be willing to share. Victoria, I know that you told me in passing, uh, <laughs> my buddy Victoria, you told me in passing, I think a year or so ago about using this uh, in your um, work with the union. Can, can you speak on that? And anybody else who'd like to share about how they've used these uh, strategies, these techniques? Okay, hi everyone. So thank you, Miguel, for, for everything. I'm just glad you exist at Dominguez Hills and you're doing this amazing work. Um, I think what's, what's important, especially about what you mentioned about form theater is that sometimes we know what we don't like in the world, but we don't know what we would replace it with. And I think these activities make force yourself to figure out if I had the power, how would I create a different type of world? Or, And I think even just practicing these, these skits or these activities, it's very empowering because once you do get into a situation, you can kind of go back to that activity and whatever you learned um, and then kind of use that to, to speak or to take action in that specific situation. So I think that's really beautiful. Um, the way we used it, um, I used to be a union organizer at UCLA and we did it a lot with the UCLA workers, right? Who were very intimidated by their bosses um, and, you know, would get fired before they had a union. So we would, we would do this um, with different scenarios that they encountered in the workplace and they would get to kind of be their manager and what, can, what would the ideal manager look like and how would they treat people with respect? So I think it was very empowering for them um, and they've completely changed as people. Like I still talk, I was talking to them last week. I used to work with them 20 years ago um, and they're completely different people because they were engaging in these activities that were very empowering, kind of allowed them to create a vision of their workplace that then they were able to, to, to make a reality. So it's just beautiful to see um, these opportunities in different places, so. Thank you for that. Vivian Vivian says she has an example to share. Yeah, I, I, I have a few I, I have a few failures, but um, but failures and then I was hard to know how to scaffold them. But I did um, I teach a class in documenting resistance where students make short films. And um, sometimes in the beginning I would we would go outside. And we would uh, do the statue, you know, a statue of what power looks like. And I would, and and each group would do a a, a scene. Um, they would think of like the chairs. How would they situate their bodies to represent power? And then the other um, group would have to kind of guess what they were trying to show. And uh, and it, you know, I was learning while I was doing it. So it, it worked at least to loosen things up, you know, same thing that you're saying, you know, and, um, but I have another example of being at a, a union conference where they use this form theater. And um, we did a, a, um, a piece on, well, I, I was a spect actor. I was in the audience when they did, um, they showed what, what happens when there's sexual harassment. And they did a scene and, and they had already created a little script. And then when the, they went through it once of somebody being harassing towards another person. And then they said, well, we're gonna do it again. And when somebody wants to intervene and say what they would do in this point in the, in the um, action, get up and then show us what you would wanna do. And it was really fantastic because people started you know, trying to do it and interacting, changing the scene, changing the script. And then another person would say, okay, you know, maybe they would get to a point where they didn't know what to say. And then they would turn to the audience. Anybody else want to intervene at this point? And it was very empowering. 
so uh, those that's another example. And of course, Miguel, uh, you know, worked at, with us at the Labor, Environmental, and Social Justice Fair year after year, um, working with hundreds of youth, getting them to interact, and just um, when they're, you know, they weren't sure what to do, and they wanted to do something with each other, and they and so we ha we wanted to do interactive kinds of work. And I think that one time he had them catch a ball uh, without hitting each other, you know, or <laughs> falling over each other. And then the dance routine of like, imitating somebody dancing if they're old. So there's so much, um, so many games that you can try. Thank you. You know, um, several, several comments here about uh, reimagining reality. Um, and and I'll, Bowal has, it's in the, it's, I think in the Theater Depressed, the first book that he wrote, that this is not the revolution, this is a rehearsal for the revolution, <laughs> right? This isn't the real thing, this is the moving us towards that. And you can't imagine how many times in, for me and for people that I've worked with in foreign theater, they'll come, I'll see them a couple months later or years later, whatever, they'll say, you know what, th th remember that scenario that we tried? And that we kind of like try different things. They'll say something almost identical happened to me a year, two years, five years later. But by that time, I had already kind of thought about it. So when we think about the Monday morning quarterback, right? Oh, damn, what I should have told the dean was, oh, what I should have done was. And in this particular case, you have an audience of, in this case, 16 people, 100 people, whatever. You're asking them, what would you do? But while it's very clear that this is not about looking for the right or wrong answer, this is not, don't think right, wrong, because what's right for you might not be right for me. You, you can get away with saying that I can't, right? It's about generating possibilities, reimagining a different reality. And in that way, I think it does it really well. Thank you for that. Alicia says, I remember doing this in your course. Michelle, oh, it's like reimagining reality together. And then Steve, I have a few examples to share that could be tried in online classes. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks, yeah, it's been a while, but the, the first class I ever taught, which is the year that um, Occupy Wall Street was happening in New York City, we did a, a class at Brooklyn College on their, ordinarily their protest and revolution class, and we did it like four of us grad students, and uh, we tried out a bunch of these games. Some of them made the instructors more nervous at seeing them than the students. Um, and a, a few of them that might be possible to try online. I, I thought of one, it was called the Siren Song, which involved similar to the sculpture that Vivian was talking about, but with sound, people people expressing auditory, that might be interesting to experiment with, with like, you know, the, people not looking at the computer, but able to hear over Zoom, or um, there was also one called uh, like the mirror sequence, where you're sort of, you have a partner and you're gradually either exactly mirroring what they're doing or subtly beginning to exaggerate and then you bounce it back and forth that that could be kind of done on zoom i think if you if you could work it out um and I, I also had a question for miguel that was something you know we we were just kind of trying this stuff out that you know back then and um your thoughts on like the debrief you know a lot of these exercises really contain some a lot of rich meanings and how do you kind of you know how much time do you spend how do you begin to like say well what what did, what did this bring up for you or, or what do you take from this and how much do you kind of leave it as just a theatrical experience. Yeah, I, no, I, I, um, I think I've made that mistake uh, one too many times of just leaving it as, as is. That's not, I don't think that works. Uh, the worst time for me was uh, I did a, a, a workshop for, they were basically children of migrant workers that got brought down to UCLA for a summer program. And uh, I was asked to do like a two day session with them. And in the second day, man, there were some heavy un, like unleashing of the issues that they encountered within the forum theater. And I was stuck. I didn't really even know what to say about it. I just, I thought, damn, now what? Right? I, I let it out of the bag. Now I don't know how to even contextualize that. I mean, there's no sense in putting it back in. Don't do that. But what do you do with it? And uh, fortunately, there were some awesome people in that room that just kind of stepped in and said, okay, well, let's, you know, let's debrief. Let's talk about this. But um, I think the debriefing, I always have to leave time at the end for any of us to just for us to just talk just to say this is what I saw this is how I'm feeling about this um, and, and um, it, it's not for me to contextualize it 
but just for us to all talk about it, right? It's, this is what I saw. This is what I experienced. This is what I felt. Um, I think we all bring our own flavor of that, right? Depending on your own skill sets, your own stylistics and how you, you can do that. But I would always recommend doing that, even within the games. The games are not necessarily heavy psychological or anything like that, but there's always, I don't know, every about two or three games, depending on how my time looks. If I have about a, a series of 10, 15 games that I'm gonna do with people, after every two or three games, uh, we stop and we just say, okay, tell us about it. How was that for you? And some people say, yeah, that made me feel really uncomfortable. I really liked it or I, did, I hated it, whatever it is, just, just debrief, debrief, debrief. Do another two, three uh, uh, exercises, debrief again. So like throughout the whole thing, that debriefing is embedding, is embedded in that. Um, I think it's a, I think it's generally a bad idea to just do this kind of awkward things and then nobody can say anything about it. Like you want to draw that out. That's the whole purpose, right? So I, I don't, did that answer your question, Steve? I'm not sure if it got to it. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the mirror. Well, that's a great one. The mirror sequences. I, I'm going to try those. I'll try them this week. We have four minutes until the end of our salon. And so any, any more questions, final questions and or concluding thoughts? Vivian. How about you, Amina? I, I, I came in late. So um, have you used this uh, or this, this type of uh, practice in your classroom? Something similar I've been uh, working on in my um, in my mind, so I'm planning something. Um, and how do I say this? Now that we've had this salon, I see more value and in sharing. So I come from um, the background of writing, creative writing. I've written several plays, and I've always been f fascinated with the theater of the absurd merging with the theater of the oppressed. And back, I want to say back in the 50s or 60s, um, there was a, a play called The Blacks, and it was about the absurdity of racism in this country. And it was very controversial at the time. And I thought, my, 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 we're still talking about some of these absurdities. And so what I'm playing around with is just the creative aspect of talking about it, but using everyday scenarios sort of like what we've talked about here today in addressing the absurdity of racism, but also the oppression associated with it. So for me, it's more of an intersectional approach from those two orientations. Now, of course, Paulo Freire, I, I love to use Paulo Freire in my classrooms, and I've done that for a number of years, but I'm branching out more into the creative aspects and outlets of expression. Thank you, Vivian, for that question. No one's no one's ever asked me that. <laughs> Talk a little bit more about the theater of the absurd. If if no one else has, I mean, if, unless somebody else wants to ask a question or make a comment, anybody else? Because I do see some students here. I want to make sure. I don't want to take up the remaining two minutes, but I want to make sure everyone's voice is heard. Jamie, you have- I'd love to jump in. Yeah, I've been a class, high school teacher for 25 years and I'm taking a sabbatical this year because this last year was crazy, crazy. And I just want to say how much I just, I love getting back into what I learned. I love what I saw for newer teachers, if there are any in here, is I, I saw what they said would happen. You know, I've stopped becoming a teacher as researcher and I- I became more and more sort of indoctrinated into what I needed to do and grew away from like my natural teaching, which was very heavy, you know, very student centered, very co-created meaning, you know, in the nineties, it was all that. And I just love this. And, um, and I, I really like the idea too, of being able to, I see these, the theater, um, I see this being an into for a novel, you know, there are still things that I need to teach in English class. So let's do the power thing and then read Lord of the Flies. And now we have something to come back to so that when you're writing about it or thinking about it, you have something real that you've already thought of. You're not writing what I think. I don't want to read what I've told them I think, right? And I just love this for creating authentic meaning. So thank you so much for um, all of this. I can't wait to look at it more. Maybe I'll do another 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> 
And and I don't want to cut anyone off, but we're down to the last minute. And I just want to make sure that we acknowledge Miguel for coming out today and sharing this wonderful, wonderful salon with us. So can we give some type of reaction to Miguel? Hey, yeah. <laughs> And I also want to acknowledge the many volunteers for the last year who have helped to make this conference come to fruition and hundreds of volunteer hours to put together this free virtual conference. So I would encourage you to please spread the word, share with your communities and networks about this conference. We'll be continuing tomorrow and Sunday. And if you would please be so kind to give us a shout out on social media, CMLCA for all on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I thank you so much for attending today. I mean, uh, I wanted to just uh, make a, a commitment here for especially those of you that are in the uh, LA area. Uh, when we uh, were in, in Omaha, the Center for the Theater of the Press, we would get together in parks, just public parks periodically, because this stuff, uh, Theater of the Press should not be captive to the university or just locked up in a theater department somewhere, but it should be just available. Uh, and so if, um, you folks that are in LA or the LA area, um, if you all ever want to get together after this pandemic winds down and just like do some theater of the oppressed on a Saturday morning in a local park, uh, let me know. Like I would love to just get together for whatever we can do, an hour, two hours, just do some games, maybe some form theater and just experiment with it so you can get a feel of it and maybe take it back to your uh, you know, relative uh, or spaces. So just, uh, I'm, I'm down to do that. That's, that's all, that would uh, be great. Awesome, awesome. And if you look in the chat, um, we have a message here for all the online updates about the conference. You can follow this link to see what's going on. And thank you again, Miguel. I'll be joining you at a park near you or here in South LA. <laughs> And thank you, everyone, and enjoy your Friday. Thank you so much for coming out and sharing this time with us. Thank you, students, for coming in and being a part of the session. Thank you, I believe, Baltimore. We have people represented all over the country, so thank you for coming in and sharing. Vivian, I'd love to talk to you more one-on-one -on -one about theater of the absurd and theater of the oppressed and the combination of both. Sounds great. Thank That's you. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, and have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thanks.